and welcome back to the Greg Horrendous Show, where today we have one of New Jersey's finest. We have Daniel Marks, the manager of prospect information for the Milwaukee Bucks of the National Basketball Association on the Greg Horrendous Show. Daniel, how you doing, my man? I'm doing great, Coach. How are you? I feel like we're like lifelong friends, and I think we kind of met maybe like four weeks ago in the Brick City uh, in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, we see each other quite frequently now. Yes, you've been one of the committed volunteers since that first event, and you, we, we met on your 25th wedding anniversary, so you, you'll always remember the first time we met. You know what? That's life won't great, let you forget. Great point. Um, we met – in, in a place that you would never think you would celebrate your 25th, you know, wedding, wedding anniversary, the rec center on, on Kinney street uh, in Newark. And I'd like you to tell our listeners, cause you're the one that brought me and you brought Steve Pico, Mitch Henderson, uh, Raf from NJIT, all the good people. How did it start? Um, how did you get involved? And then how did you kind of connect with all of us basketball people? Yeah, so um, this is my seventh season with the Bucks. Um, over the course of those seven years, I've traveled a lot uh, for work with our G League team, scouting, a uh, variety of different things. And a few years ago, I had seen a tweet from a sports writer I thought it was Ian O'Connor from ESPN, but I actually reached out to Ian about the tweet, and he was like, yeah, I never tweeted that, but it was, uh, it was a sports writer who said they collected unused hotel toiletries from their time covering the Yankees and donated them to a homeless shelter at the end of the season. And I always thought that was kind of a cool idea, but never had acted on it. Uh, this past December, I was like, you know what, I'm going to start collecting myself, and I've made a number of contacts at the NCAA, NBA, and G League levels. I'll try to get some buddies to collect as well. Um, I call it, It's called scouting and scavenging, and we had uh, about a good two months before COVID hit where people were collecting supplies. When COVID hit, uh, it hit New Jersey really hard, as you know, Coach. Um, New York sure. City, New Jersey have been some of the hardest hit areas. Uh, my grandparents were born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, which was the hardest hit city uh, in New Jersey. So I had had people send me the supplies they collected uh, via UPS, FedEx, collected those, reached out to a couple of hotels that had some leftover supplies. We held a one-time fundraiser to purchase more supplies. Um, and it reached out to a couple of people in Newark, like, how can we get these supplies, these hygiene supplies, shampoos, soaps, toothpaste, toothbrushes, to people that need them during these times, because being hygienic is always important, but with COVID, it's doubly important. So reached out to Dawn Haynes, um, got connected to her through a guy named Alterique Best, who runs the Newark Hub Trauma Center. Dawn works in the mayor's office, and... She coordinated bringing the toiletry donations to their weekly food delivery program in partnership with HelloFresh, where they deliver groceries throughout the city to underserved residents who don't have access or the means to purchase meals. So we partnered with them on June 10th and put the toiletry kits inside of these meal kits that they send out each week. And, you know, given the involvement I had from people in the basketball community, and what's going on in the country right now with the George Floyd and the protests and COVID, there's a lot of negativity. So I wanted to bring people in the New Jersey basketball and broader sports community together for a day of positivity and giving back. So, you know, you mentioned a lot of the coaches that we had, and, and it's a funny story. Most of the coaches I didn't know before inviting them to this right. event. So I, I met Coach Peichel, had met Mike Larkin on his staff, um, but the rest of the coaches – uh, you know, we had Mitch Henderson, yourself, uh, Joe Lawford of Rutgers Newark, Jeff Rafferty of NJIT, a couple of assistants at Seton Hall and Monmouth, Tony Bazella and Carla Baru at Seton Hall Women's and Princeton Women's, Matt Laughlin with WFN Radio. I had never met any of them in person. So I reached out, sent an email about what we were doing, and they were all uh, very supportive and, and wanted to be a part of it. And it was cool to see you know, programs that compete against each other on the court, you know, come together for, for a fun and rewarding day um, right. on the 10th. 
I'll tell you one thing. It's a fascinating project. Now, Kenny, it's like, you get there and it's like organized controlled chaos because like all the coaches got there and we're just kind of commiserating. And the next thing you know, there are boxes being uh, moved and then there's things being put in bags and then bags are being moved and they're being labeled and then they're being uh, put in crates and, uh, and, and it's just people working together and, it's really, it's really incredible. And there's no color, you know, like there's, you know, it's predominantly a black uh, audience and crowd, but there are white people, Spanish people, they're just basketball people, non-basketball people. But for like two hours, everybody's just working together and the finished product is tw almost 2,100 meals that are uh, prepared and, getting ready to be delivered for the people of Newark. Is that basically the, the whole, uh, the gist of the day, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, I mean, they set up about 8.30, they start bringing in um, HelloFresh and table to table, supply the ingredients. Um, the project is spearheaded by Mitty Baraka, who is the chief of staff for Mayor Ross Baraka. Um, right. Dawn Haynes and the Brick City Peace Collective are, are partners of ours and partners of the cities on this. But it's, you know, a really, like you say, it's a really impressive assembly line and everyone kind of has their stations that they go to each week. And right. if you kind of encroach on someone's normal territory, it throws off the whole vibe. Yeah. It's almost like a player who's in transition and doesn't know where to be on the floor and it, it mucks up the whole fast break. That's kind of what it feels like when, you, when you're when you in the wrong spot on the assembly line. It's funny. Let the truth be known. My first task was taking the finished product, the bag, and putting 10 in each crate. And I was with Coach Pike doing it. And then we did them, like, just put them straight down. And then I decided to turn them. When I turned them, it was made it a lot easier to put them in. So I told Paykel that now we were ready for management. You know what I mean? Like we, we figured out a better way to do things. And since then, I'm on the I'm, – I'm near the very end of the bagging, and I have my vegetable girls next to me. And I just take – like literally now I can take four bags in each hand, deliver it, and they put the last vegetable in. And then it gets uh, tagged, and then it goes into the – it's just really – and when you're done, Daniel, and that's why you talk about team, you just feel like you've accomplished um, something that is good, and you're doing it with perfect strangers. But now each week that I go, I just feel a, a, like a different bond. And the music, <laughs> I don't know if you know so much about – my program, but I come out every practice to music, to, to Springsteen, but the music there is all, it's discos of the disco 70s and soul and Aretha Franklin. How good is the music, Daniel? The music's great. And today there was like a five minute period where the music turned off and you could I hear know. everyone like panting and out of breath. And it was, it was kind of eerie. <laughs> Without music, you could just hear the rustling of the bags and like the people that have like the real jobs out in Detroit back in the day. And when there were assembly lines and big knitting uh, embroidery uh, factories, you can see where without music, you can mentally, you can lose your mind because it's just a constant, you know, um, I don't even know what to say. There's a rhythmic to it and it's not like, the greatest sound in the world, but with the music kind of takes you into another place. And I think I just find myself dancing when I'm, I'm going from here to there and convincing with all the people on the, uh, on the line. It's just, it's just a lot of fun. I really appreciate, you know, you bringing me into this world, Daniel. Yeah, no, for sure. And it was my, my first time there was June 10th and I've gone back every Wednesday since. And, you know, the thing, as you mentioned, Coach, for your listeners, it, it's open to anyone that wants to come down. They're doing Absolutely. this until, until September 1st at the JFK Rec Center, 211 West Kinney Street. Um, 
You know, they, everyone's in a mask and gloves, which is, you can't say that for a lot of locales in the country right now. Right. Um, they take your temperature at the door, you sign in and then you get to work. And, and, you know, it's people that are Newark residents, people from outside the city, people that work for the city. It's just a really great mix of people. And like you said, at first you kind of feel a little bit like a stranger and like, oh, what should I be doing on the first day? But as you come back, you kind of know, okay, this person's going to be stationed here. Here's what I can right. help with. And you kind of become a part of it too. And I've got to brag on my FDU partners now. Coach Ange, our women's basketball coach, and her assistant, Jess. Um, coach Rob Natoma and his assistant, uh, Ethan. Um, today we had our softball coach and one of his friends come. So and my son Trey has been there. So we're trying to do as much as we can uh, at Fairleigh Dickinson as far as giving and uh, being part of this incredible community that's called life. Um, and, 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 and again, I see Mitch when I go back and I call Raf. He's coming back next week for NJIT. It really becomes a social event, but I, uh, you know, we just won a huge award, Daniel. We were the top charity givers of time in the NEC. It was Fairleigh Dickinson University. And wow. now we're continuing that, uh, um, that mantra for set forth by our, our athletic director, Brad Hurlbut. And here we do a lot for the Boys and Girls Club in uh, Hackensack and in Lodi and the 21 and over program in, uh, in Lodi as well. So we, we, we love to give back. And I'm just so happy that you were able to, you know, include us and, and, and now we'll continue this. Yeah, no, I know. I appreciate you guys coming out and bringing, bringing new people each week. And I think, you know, the thing that's most impressive to me, and you kind of touched on it, just the level of, like, I feel like each time we're there, like the first time it was, we ended at, you know, 1035, 1040. And then yeah. the assembly line last week was 1020. And today I looked at my watch and we're at 1006. It's like a well-oiled yeah, machine. We're getting better. Yeah. Hey, you got to tell me what, what is a manager of prospect information for a young guy? You've been with the Milwaukee Bucks for seven years and, and our listeners are very educated on college basketball and pro, but more college. Tell our viewers and our listeners what a manager of prospect information actually does every day. Yeah. So it, it, it you know, it, my job is is primarily focused during the college season. Um, I help prepare our general manager, John Horst, uh, for college games that he's scouting. Um, I'll put together one sheeters of prep for him. I'll you know help with some of his logistics. If he wants me to go to the game with him, I'll accompany him to the game. And uh, I don't know if you watch Veep, but sort of a, a similar role to Gary, who's uh, Selena Meyer's right-hand person, just kind of fill in the gaps and make sure that the game and scouting experience is as beneficial for John as possible. And then I'll do some regional scouting, some background intel work uh, as well. But that, that's my primary responsibility. I, I still help out with our G League team on some roster stuff. I was the director of operations there for two years before this role. So I've been with the Bucks seven years in four different roles. So it's been a, a great ride and I've gotten to experience a lot of different parts of the industry. And, um, you know, it, it's been a great place to work. Tell me the Greg Horenda show, uh, Daniel, is about the genesis of how you became who you are today. Tell me, like, have you always been just an absolute sports junkie? I know actually your dad was at, wasn't your dad there the first day? Yeah, yeah. So my dad was there, yep, the first day. Uh, he, he claims he played an integral role in uh, shifting the levers of making sure the toiletries got in the right bags. So he was kind of running back and forth between stations. Yep. Um, yep. But yeah, I mean, I grew up a huge sports fan. My dad's a big sports fan. My, both my grandfathers are, are really into sports. Um, you know, played sports all growing up. Unfortunately, uh, genetics, five, ten and a half, not overly quick nor athletic. Uh, ended my athletic career in the high school days. Um, became a manager at Vanderbilt University uh, my first year. Um, the uh, Commodores. 
The Commodores, yes. Coach Kevin Stallings and uh, worked for him for four years, which was a great experience. We won the SEC tournament my junior year. We beat Kentucky, uh, which had Anthony Davis, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, Deron Lamb, Marcus T. Yeah, that was a, yep. They won the national championship that year. So they were 38-2, and two, and their two losses were Indiana in the regular season and us in the SEC tournament. Um, so really cool to be a part of that. And then – you know, I did, uh, I had interned for Dime Magazine, a basketball magazine based in New York, a lot of summers in college. And, you know, I was thinking media, you know, I've always had an interest in politics, so maybe law school. I actually interned in City Hall in Newark one summer um, after my junior year. But, you know, I was really fascinated by the team building side of things and putting a roster together. So kind of focused on front office uh, internships. I interviewed with a number of teams, uh, didn't get a couple, was in the finalists for a number of G League internships. When the Bucks called, uh, offered me an internship. Um, it's a funny story about the Bucks. I, I wrote an article in Dime Magazine in 2010, which was the summer LeBron left for Miami. And it said the Bucks had an underrated summer and they had signed Drew Gooden and re-signed John Salmons and drafted Larry Sanders. And it didn't turn out to be as good of a summer as I had prognosticated. But the article got picked up by the Bucks organization, and my uh, one of my current uh, bosses, Dave Dean, reached out and said, "John Hammond, who's the general manager at the time, wants to talk to you about your story." And this was the beginning of my sophomore year at Vanderbilt, and I'm he thought at the time that I was like a young up and coming like Woj or something. Little did he know I was a college right. intern. But his daughter's best friend happened to be in my class at Vanderbilt, and we kind of stayed in touch over the years, and that's how that connection to the Bucks uh, came to wow. be. Wow. So you never know who's watching and who's reading and who's listening. Hey, Daniel, you got to tell me the Jason Kidd story about you inviting him to your birthday. This is classic stuff. Yeah, so uh, I grew up a diehard – Knicks fan to start out. Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., but my dad was, grew up in New York, so he was a Knicks fan. Um, then we moved to New Jersey before the third grade, and as you know, Coach, uh, tickets to get to the Nets in the Meadowlands were a lot cheaper than going to see the Knicks at the Garden, so yes. my dad would get, uh, the Nets had a, a plan where you get uh, season tickets for the full season for $299, so we'd get two season tickets for 600 bucks wow. and with that comes a uh it was called like an all access pass where if you get to the game more than an hour before you can go down in the lower level and watch warm up so what we would do is we go around that time an hour before i go down try to get some autographs and we just stay in the lower level because it was never filled uh jason kidd was my favorite player so one year i wrote to him you know, invited him to my birthday party. Uh, he never responded. My mom kept a copy of the letter. And uh, fast forward to 2014, he gets hired as head coach of the Bucks. You know, I showed him that letter, you know, a couple months into the tenure, he signed it, and I got it framed. And um, then uh, that following May, my mom got a birthday cake that said, you know, 13 years, 14 years later, Jason Kidd can finally come to your birthday party. So we took a photo with the cake and got picked up by like ESPN, SI, uh, yeah. the Mike and Mike show. So it was, it was pretty neat. Very cool. Daniel, tell me like now that you've, you know, obviously been with a professional organization for seven years, where is your personal growth? Where where do you go? I mean, you sit there and, and, and you have the appearance of being a, a young GM or a, uh, I would dare would I not say that a, a politician or someone of stature. What, where, where, does, where does your uh, professional ceiling uh, take you? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a great question. And I think, you know, like, you know, I'm sure you did, you know, when you're working it your way up in basketball, you want to reach, you know, I'm sure you had the, the aspirations when you were his assistant coach to run your own program one day. Um, right. I'd love to, to be a general manager someday, but I think, you know, one of the things I've realized, um, and I'm sure you can attest to this too, is as great as, you know, and the Bucks, you know, won 15 games my first year, 
and uh, now are, you know, the number one team by record in, in the NBA. So it's been quite a transformation on the floor. But a lot of the most impactful memories I've had of the last seven years have been the people I've met, the relationships I've built, and, you know, giving back, you know, through scouting and scavenging and doing stuff like this, you know. So, you know, I, I'd love to become, you know, a general manager, but I think that it, you know, one of those things where, you know, you, I really like making a difference and connecting with people and whatever avenue I can continue to do that. I love working in basketball and want to continue working in basketball. And, you know, I think some people get married to the job and kind of sacrifice, you know, giving back or their own relationships or with their own family. So that's something I, I try to be very cognizant of, I'm trying to find that balance. So, yeah. you know, that, that's kind of a long-winded answer uh, to your question. Well, you know what? You look like it. Uh, and usually, you know, you gravitate to that which you secretly love in life. And obviously, you secretly love the game, but you love people. And you talk about people. You got to give us the freak, man. You got to give me one little story about what kind of great guy he is or what uh, – how he affected this, this will be This will be a really good one for your listeners. So. I so Giannis was drafted uh, 2013 by the Bucks, And I was at the draft that year with my dad, my sister, and a close family friend of ours by the name of Ryan Schlesinger. And we were on the concourse uh, getting some ice cream. And Giannis had gotten picked by the Bucks and just walked by. And my dad is like, oh, you know, can I get a picture of you with my kids? So it's me, my sister, and Giannis, who's you know, 40 pounds lighter before he became, you know, shredded like he is now. And uh, my buddy Ryan was not in the picture. And he like laments it to this day that he didn't get in this picture with Giannis on draft night. But fast forward to early October of 2013. It's like my first week on the job. And Giannis needed a cable installed and needed someone to be at the house to let the cable guys in and be there when they came. Right. So I was, you know, told, Hey, you know, just hang out at his house, you know, until they're stay there until they're done. So it was about eight 30. I went and you know, the cable guys give you a window. We'll be there between 10 and two and they <laughs> show up at three. So, you know, it was a long day and I was told, you know, don't leave, you know, just stay there. So I, this was like my first week on the job. I didn't know any restaurants nearby to call. Yeah. you know, to, to deliver. So I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to see if he has any, anything in his pantry. So I took like three Oreos. <laughs> now, never, he's never going to know, you know, that, that, that happened. And then the next day he comes up to me, he's like, Dan, he's like, did you eat my Oreos? I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm like, no, not. And he's like, he's like, cause I was missing three Oreos. And I'm like, uh, so like, I kind of denied it for like a couple of years. And then I finally, <laughs> Fessed up to it, and when he made his first All Star game, I got him like a couple boxes of Oreos. But you know, anytime Giannis sees me now, he'll be like, "That's the man that stole my Oreos." So, um, but <laughs> well, it, it's just like he obviously he is an incredible uh, worker, like ridiculously hard worker, just a special, special guy, and um, you know, he's just tr truly been amazing to watch him grow on and off the floor. And I think one of the, the cool things to see about Giannis is he, he is so, you know, appreciative of how far he's come because he was, you know, peddling goods in Athens uh, as a kid to, to help his family survive. And he has a really good knack for identifying fans after a game and he'll give his sneakers away. And like, there's some really great videos out there of, of fans just interacting with Giannis and being completely stunned that he would like take the time to come over and say hello. So that, that's been really cool at, in addition to all of his on-court uh, play. Well, Daniel, you have a fan now here at Fairleigh Dickinson. I've always been a Buck fan. I was a, I liked the Bucks when Oscar and, uh, and Luau Cinder were Bucks. And my favorite player, of all time, when I was a young boy, it was Greg Smith who played for the Bucks because he wore number four. He was the only NBA player at that point that had the name Greg. So I, I've always loved the Milwaukee Bucks, and uh, now I have further reason to do that. 
I, the clock is ticking. I can't thank you enough for bringing us into your world and let's stay connected. I'd love to have you come to a practice and do a game and watch the nights. And uh, I just thank you for everything, Daniel. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Coach. I enjoyed it, and uh, I'll see you next Wednesday. You are the best. Go Commodores. All right.